All right, so John 14, as you can see, they got the projector up and running. That's great. Uh, like I said yesterday, I came in and fixed all of that. And, uh, praise God. So, you know, I, I told my son when I took the tester back, you know, sometimes it's just the little things. Thank God for the little things, right? Because I was not going to get up in that ceiling and run new cable from there, point A to point B. It's easier to plug something into the wall and say, it's fixed. So it was fixed. So, John 14, verses 25 through 31 this morning, I'm going to read. These things I have spoken to you while remaining with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. You heard that I said to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in regard to me. But so that... The world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let's go from here. Father, we thank you for this word. I pray that it would go forth in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That, Lord, you would touch our hearts, touch our spirits and our minds this morning. Reveal to us your truth and what you have for us. And may Jesus Christ be glorified and lifted above all else. May his name be be lifted up. May we receive the fullness of your spirit, the fullness of the truth of God in our lives. Bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. One real quick thing before I begin this morning. I want to go back to verse 30. Because I'm using NASB here and it says, um, I will not speak much more with you for the rule of this world is coming. He has nothing in regard to me. Notice that word I think is a, it's italicized there. And that's what I, I want to just kind of give you an idea on that word regard. I'm, not going to, I'm going to preach on it, but I want to make a point here on that. What Jesus is saying here, the ESV puts it this way. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. I think that's important. Jesus is sitting here now, and he's talking to his disciples. And we're in the midst, we're finishing off this chapter 14, which wasn't chapter 14 for Jesus. It was strictly a conversation. But uh, I, where, he, where they use the word regard, I thought about them. I thought, Lord, there's, you know, there's got to be more to this. And the idea here that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what takes place, no matter what's going on, the world has no claim on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right? It's him and the Father. And that's what he says. Okay? The world has no claim, but the Father does. And I think as believers, that should be true for each and every one of us as well. Let's not let the world have a claim on us, but praise God if the Father does. Amen? Amen. So I just thought I'd kind of throw that out. That was kind of that's a freebie. Uh, over the past several weeks, we've been looking into what is often referred to as Jesus' farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Now, we didn't look at chapter 13, but John 13 is really where the discourse begins. Okay, so he, he goes through, and we've looked at 14, but in 13, it, it, continue, it begins with like the Lord's Supper. We see in, in chapter 13 that Jesus also washes the disciples' feet. We see uh, things taking place here that kind of are preparatory for what Jesus is going to share now with the disciples. I mean, think about it. Here, you, you sit down, you have a meal with the Lord, and he takes the time to wash your feet, okay? An act of, serv of, of service that he he gives to the disciples as he begins to make a point. And I think that as we talk about this, realize that what's taking place here in 13 uh, that we didn't discuss and look at is preparatory for what's about to take place. I think there's a transition here that's beginning where Jesus is getting ready to leave and to give authority and power to those who are going to be left behind. But at the same time, he's concerned that in the process of doing so, that they're going to feel lost. We've already talked about the fact that they will feel as orphans. I, I, the one song that we had this morning had the, the idea that uh, an orphan without a home. 
Praise God as believers of Jesus Christ. We are not orphans without a home. Amen? Amen. That we, as Jesus Christ, we have a home. We have a, we have a, a, a Father in heaven who has adopted us, made us his. The fair, well, this course will continue through chapters 15 and 16, and I don't know if I'll continue through this or not, but just know that if you want to kind of get into a little bit further study, go to chapters 15 and 16, where Jesus kind of, 13 through 16 is the, the whole discourse. This morning, John continues to share Jesus' address to the, to the uh, followers of the coming Holy Spirit. That's really what I wanted to look at in chapter 14. Chapter 14 deals with the paraclete. Okay, the Holy Spirit, our coming advocate, uh, our hope, our teacher, our promise. The one whom God will send. Well, Jesus is going to leave and the disciples are going to feel abandoned. But Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'm sending another. I'm sending one who will, who will guide you in all things, who will teach you in all things, who will bring God's truth to you in all things. He will, he's the revealer of truth. He will give to you something that the world can never give you. And because of the Holy Spirit, the world has no claim on us, as I said. So the idea is there. Here again, he reminds them of the things that he has shared with them during this time on earth. He also continues to offer them words of comfort, reminding them that they will not be left alone. They will not be left as orphans, as we saw a couple weeks ago. When he departs, he, he doesn't leave us alone. I, I just, my mind just went there. I, I get this picture, we, every once in a while, you know, first, Debbie and I were, you know, we like Turner classic movies, right? And we watched a movie recently uh, about a, a baby that was abandoned. And it was really interesting because I didn't know Danny Kaye could sing, or Danny Thomas, I didn't know Danny Thomas could sing. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, this little girl was left outside this, uh, this, this, this house or apartment place in, in New York. And she is found by three men, uh, uh, a, a Jew, a Catholic, and a, a Christian pastor, a Catholic policeman, a Christian pastor, and, and, and a Jew, Jewish man who works in the temple. And the judge decides to let the three of them, with the help of the Jewish man's mother, raise her. So she has like, her name is like six names long. She's got like all three religions and everything. And it's kind of interesting how how um, just she gets like the best of all these worlds in her life as the three of them kind of raise her under each with her own view. But I got to thinking about that, how blessed, it, it's a movie, of course she was blessed, right? It's almost like, like 1940s Hallmark. But the idea there that, that she's blessed because here is this young girl who's just left abandoned and every time I think of this, I get this image of orphan in my mind. That's what I picture. I picture this, this just this little bundle being left on a doorstep somewhere, wrapped up with, with a note pinned to it. Take care of my child. I can't. And here Jesus is going to leave the disciples. He's going to wrap them up and put a note on them. No, he's not. Because he said, well, I can't be here. I've already made accommodations for I will not leave you as an orphan because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Father will send the Spirit as I and the Father work together to adopt you into our family. I just think it's so awesome. Really, I mean, think about that. So as we look at this this morning, we look at the closing of this passage, there are three things that I think we need to see about the Holy Spirit as we close out that are important. And and this morning, you get a Greek lesson, okay? You get Hebrew over there, you get Greek over here, okay? So I'm, I'm going to have some Greek words, and hopefully I have worked through them enough to be able to pronounce them properly without necessarily totally chopping them up like I did that one phrase this morning next door. But let's see what happens. So there are three things that the Spirit does when the Spirit is sent. And the first thing that he says in this passage is the Spirit will teach you. The Spirit teaches now, this is important. I, I love to teach. You know, that's, 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 that's kind of like my thing. I really do. I don't know why. I guess it's because in the process of teaching, I learn. You know? And the Holy Spirit has been, it's been sent to teach us, which means that if I'm going to be taught, I must be teachable. 
That means I can't walk around all the time thinking that I've got all the answers or I know everything or I've been in the church for so long that I, I, I just, everything is just like clear to me. I must always be teachable. And I think that when it comes to things of God and his infinite wisdom and his infinite knowledge, I must remain teachable till the grave. And it's the spirit that does this. It's the spirit that teaches. And the Greek word that, that, that Jesus uses here for teach is didasko, which means to teach or instruct. Very simple word, right? Teach or instruct. Um, and while it, the word is teach there, I think the idea of instruct is very important. See, I get this image in my mind. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, as a teacher, I can stand, and I believe me, I've sat in some classes where teaching is like, geez, I don't even know. I better fall asleep. It's monotonous. It's this and that. We were talking about this this morning as I prepared for this last, to retake this last exam. And Debbie said to me, well, you have notes that you got from the, from the, from the whiteboard, from the blackboard when you were sitting in class. And I said, no, it was really a, a different environment, uh, you know, because we sat around these tables and the professor would sit over here and, and it was more of uh, an open discussion. He would bring things up and we would discuss. And that was kind of the, the method that was used. It wasn't sit on the board, kind of right on the board and do PowerPoints and this and that and everybody kind of doze off uh, and fall asleep. Teaching to me is just standing up here and doing this. Instructing is interaction. When I'm, in, when I'm being, when, when the Holy Spirit is instructing me, and that's why I put this word up here instead of teach. Teach is just receiving. You, I have classes where I, I feel that with some students I'm teaching and others I'm instructing. And the difference is the response from those who I am instructing. Because something's coming back to me. You know, uh, if you have an instructor who does things hands on, you know, it, it, if I'm taking woodshop, I want, to, I want someone who's going to let me get my hands in there and become a part of this. And I think the Holy Spirit does this. It carries the idea of imparting skill or knowledge on someone else. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't just teach us the things of God. He instructs us in the things of God, of who Jesus Christ is, so that we're, we're gaining this knowledge. We're gaining the skill that becomes a part of being a believer in Jesus Christ, a part of who we are. So the Holy Spirit instructs in the knowledge of God. Okay, the Holy Spirit instructs in the knowledge of God. And so this is what we see here as we, we look at this. He does not just instruct in some things. And this is what Jesus says. He says the Holy Spirit is coming to instruct you in all things. All things. We are not just getting a partial revelation of God. We are getting the full teaching and revelation of who God is. And if we are hungry for the things of God, then we will become, we will receive instruction on all things relating to the Father and all things relating to the Son. And so what the Spirit doing is He's instructing us on the very mind and the very heart of God Himself. It's God revealing God to us. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And, and I think this is, this is important for us to understand that this, this teaching spirit, uh, this instructor of the things of God, needs to be an, an integral part of our daily walk and our daily life. How do we know truth from falsehood? How do we know, um, the, you know what, how to live and, and what to say and what to do and what not to do if not for the instruction of God? If I begin to dictate or think that I know what's best for me, I will fail. But if I allow the Spirit of God to guide and direct me, I'm not going to be perfect. But I do have a way of understanding the truth that is God, of walking in that truth each and every day. So the Spirit teaches. The second thing we see is that the Spirit reminds. The Greek word here. The super memento. How'd you like that one? I think I did it. First try, too. I'm not going to do it again. I hope you got it. It simply means to remind, of course, as we see here. But again, I like the second definition better to bring back to remembrance. 
okay? It's, it's a little more detailed here. It carries the idea of causing one to remember or recall. Now, why is this important? Well, Jesus says the Spirit's going to instruct you. But you know what? I think kind of what the underlying tone here is, he's going to teach or instruct you, but you're going to forget. But that's okay. Because he'll remind you, he'll bring back to you remembrance those things which you forget, those things which you lose, those things that you don't hold on to. Because we're not perfect. None of us. But praise God, we have a spirit who is perfect and who brings that perfection to us and reminds us of the things, brings back to our remembrance of the things that, that we have forgotten. Now, this is, I think, very significant as well because the Spirit also brings back to our remembrance all that we have seen and heard about Jesus. All that we've seen and heard about Jesus. I, I, you know, again, here, it's, it's so important that we understand the Spirit's role in our lives. Because we live in a world today where the truth of God's word is under attack. Both outside the church and sometimes within inside the church. And we must be men and women who are grounded in the word of God. We must allow the, it's the spirit that causes us to throw up the red flag if we see or hear something that just doesn't line up. Now I'm not saying that we have all the answers. I'm not saying I have all the answers. Only God has all the answers. But the Holy Spirit can quicken our spirits to question and think about things that we see or hear. Not to say that's wrong, that's right, because there are a lot of people that are, that are professing what's wrong, that's right, and a lot of people that are professing that's right, what's right, that's wrong. But what it's not about that, it's about us and God. It's about me and you, each one of us living our lives as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Do not let the things of this world or others draw you away or lure you away from these things. It must be something that we're sensitive to, and only the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. Man does not have the truth that God has because we are not truthful. We are self-seeking. We are self-serving. But the Holy Spirit will bring this back to our remembrance. I read the word of God. And again, I'm not taking from the perspective of me interpreting this as I want it to be interpreted. I study the word of God and, and I, I, sometimes, you know, someone will share something with me. And, and it, I don't know, I'm one of those people, I guess, that if I hear something and it intrigues me, I prayerfully seek the truth in God's word. I don't just accept it because someone of authority has put it out there. You might sit here today and say, well, he's the pastor. He's, he's the voice. He's the, he's the authority figure. He's the voice in the congregation. But no pastor, no leader is perfect. And as I've said before, don't just take everything I say and walk away and go, that's the way it is. If it, if it causes you to question something, seek the word. Seek the truth by the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God be the one who brings this back to your remembrance, not me. I don't care how many followers a leader has. It doesn't make them worry all the time. And we've seen this time and time again throughout history. And I'm not just talking about the idea of us from a spiritual Christian perspective or the church perspective. The same is true in life and in the world in all areas. This includes promises which Jesus has given to us. The Spirit will bring these promises back and, 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 and remind us of those things. When Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, and sometimes you feel lost and alone and without Christ, you realize you're not because he already said, I'm not going to do that. And if you're feeling it, it's not because Jesus has decided to abandon you. Prayerfully seek the promise, the truth. As we've been talking about these names of God in the, in the, in, in the Sunday school class, we talked about you know, the God who heals, the Lord my banner this morning, you know, different ones like that. We talked about the idea of these are these are not these names are not silver bullets. Okay? 
They're not something special. We talked about, you know, um, the Lord being our shepherd this morning. Uh, and, you know, I know those of you that were in Sunday school, you've heard this already, but those of you that are online, you haven't. For you, it's for you. The rest of you sit here, stay awake. Anyway, the, but the point is, is that, you know, we, this, this, we, we talk about the Lord my shepherd, but then if we kind of look at that, it's a shepherd bleeds, a shepherd dies, a shepherd takes care. We look at Psalm 23. But that word is also, could also mean friend. Okay? Think about that. The Lord, my friend. Now, that gives me confidence. I can invoke that name of God, and that gives me confidence, not because it's magical or mystical, but because I know I have a God who is my friend. I don't care what the world says about my relationship with God or, or if, if God does this or God does that or God does it. He has promised to be my friend. He's promised to be my shepherd. He's promised to be my healer. He is, I am. The list goes on. He is ours and we are his. But as we look at it, Exodus 15, remember this. God also has requirements. If you will do these things, then I will heal you. We want God to do all this and bless us with everything, but we're not willing to stay the course in our own lives. And the Holy Spirit reminds us when we're off course, brings back to our remembrances the promises, but also the conditions of those promises. And this leads us to the last thing, which is the Spirit's peace. The Greek word here is irene, and it simply means peace, which is translated as peace, but I like this word too, tranquility. Okay, tranquility. It carries with it the idea of a state of well-being or harmony. And as I was preparing this message, and I was working through some things yesterday on, it was nice, it was quiet in the house. I was sharing with the uh, one of my classes on Friday, I said, you know, yeah, I, they, one of the students said, when are you getting our papers graded? Well, I finished all the papers on Friday because I had a lot to grade last week. I got all done on Friday, and I said, and tomorrow, the ladies, and my, my wife and the ladies are going to a, a little conference or retreat thing that they've done all day long. I'm going to uh, sit at home. Of course, I ended up coming here and doing this, but I'm going to sit at home. I'm going to nice and quiet. I'm going to finish my sermon. I've already started it. I'm going to finish my sermon, and then I'm going to watch Ohio State. It's going to be a nice, relaxing one student said, are we invited over? I said, I think you missed the point where I said it was going to be a nice, relaxing day. <laughs> now, as I thought about this, and I thought about the idea that my wife and I are very different. She's beach. I'm mountains. And I think I realize why now. There's no tranquility at the beach. She gives me a look of shock and awe. There's not. You got the surf making all kinds of noise. You got gulls trying to snatch your food, right? You got all kinds of people making noise. Give me a crick in the mountains and nobody around except chirping crickets or whatever, creek, river, I don't care. Tranquility. We have different ideas of what tranquility is all about, don't we? What's tranquil? It's what brings us peace. It's what helps us to relax. It's, and the Holy Spirit brings tranquility into our lives and brings us into the presence of God. We can, we can enjoy, we can relax. He teaches us, he reminds us, and then he comforts us and brings us peace. We don't have to be anxious for anything, as the Word of God says. Why? Because the spirit, the advocate, the paraclete, is the spirit of peace. You see, the Holy Spirit is given to us as a spirit of peace. And the thing is, and I think in this world today, what we're dealing with, it's important we understand this, it's not a temporary, artificial peace like that offered by the world. I can sit at home, okay, and the house is quiet, and I could think, wow, it's going to be a nice, peaceful day. But there's always something that disrupts it. There's always something that kind of gets in the way. There's something that kind of just 
removes my focus. Don't let that be the case with you spiritually. Let the spirit of God be your spirit of peace. It's a tranquility in times of trouble. It's a tranquility in times of hardship. It's a peace that conquers all fear and anxiety. You know, it's, it's important for us to understand this, especially during these times. Again, we, we deal with this, this, this whole idea of this ever-prolonged pandemic, and there are some that are, can be way overly cautious. And there's nothing wrong with being cautious, but, but let's not be fearful. And there are others who have no sense at all and think that, you know, I'm not going to be fearful. I'm just going to, and I say no sense, I don't mean, I don't mean to be derogatory there. But the idea is, 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 you know, they don't care about others. I think this is a great example for us of what we do with spiritually. Let's not become so elitist in our thinking that we think that we've got it made and we don't have to worry about anything. But if the other, other side of this is let's not think that we we'll be so fearful that we think we're never going to get there. Let's find and the spirit of peace and let the spirit of peace guide us. Give us wisdom so that we don't become um, elitist or we don't become overly fearful. But we realize that God has made a plan for us to walk in the ways of the Lord and the things of the Lord and, and he reminds us, he teaches us, and then to think, really, if you think about it, if I take what he, he instructs me with, and if I take what, what he reminds me of, how can I not have peace? Because Jesus Christ has overcome all of it. There is nothing that the world can take from me. Why? Because it has no claim on if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, this world has no claim on you, you have peace. Not as the world gives, but as the Spirit gives. So as we close out this section of the Gospel of John this morning, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit is the believer's source for all things. If we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and bring back to our remembrance what we learn, then we can experience the promised peace of Jesus Christ. He's trying to comfort the disciples here. He's trying to bring them to understand that there's going to be a major shift change here in what's going on in your lives. But be at peace. For it is his peace, not ours, that we must seek each and every day. To do so, we must choose to walk in the instruction of the Holy Spirit and let him serve as our ever-present reminder of who we are in Jesus Christ. It's not by my might, it's not by my power, it's not in my spirit that all these things are possible, but only through Jesus Christ. Only through the Spirit of God. And as we, as we close out this morning, my challenge to you is this. If you're, if you're, if you're struggling in your relationship with God, if you're finding yourself struggling to, to understand or accept or receive this word, let the spirit of instruction instruct you. If you're forgetting, you're, if you're having trouble in your remembrance, the things in your relationship with God or with Jesus Christ, let the spirit of remembrance remind you. But most importantly, if you're finding yourself to be anxious over whatever is going on in your life, let the spirit of pre peace bring you tranquility. Only the spirit of God can bring us true comfort. Jesus, throughout this chapter, continues to point to this spirit, the one who will come so that we will not be orphans, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of peace, our spirit, and God's spirit united. As we prepare to close in prayer this morning, Mike, I just have to ask, you know, I want you to consider who is the Holy Spirit to me? What role does the Holy Spirit play in my life? I know as Pentecostals, we want to think of from the, from the miraculous, the spiritual gifts and everything, but you know what? The Spirit came to empower us 
to guide us, to lead us in the things of God. What we see here is, in this chapter is that Jesus is saying, I'm going away to send the Spirit so that you can have a relationship with my Father. That's why I'm asking this morning. Have, have you allowed the Holy Spirit to bring you back into a relationship with the Father? Do you feel like you're an orphan? Do you need the Spirit of adoption? Father, as we close our time together this morning, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, that you would be with each and every one of us. That, Lord, you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us become men and women willing to receive instruction. Let us become men and women willing to receive remembrance. Let us become men and women willing to walk in peace. Not ours, not the world's, but the Spirit's. Thank you, Lord, that we, for the privilege we have of gathering together, for, for sharing in your word, for sharing in a time of worship, for sharing together in, the, in, in these kingdom principles. I thank you for your servant, John, who, who has chosen to put these things in his letter to us. And for, or for Jesus Christ, who has chosen to share these things, these words of comfort. This, this chapter 14, Lord, is just, it, it's, it's, it's a message of peace for all of us. That's where it goes. That's, where, that's what you're bringing to us. Let us receive it with glad and joyful hearts. And for any, Lord, who, who need instruction, who need reminding, who need peace, let the Spirit of God, our Comforter, the Advocate, the Paraclete, Speak to them and let them receive it with glad and joyful heart, what the Spirit has to offer. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. We'll be praying here in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out so we close out the recording. Um, just a reminder, uh, I think we've got some things running up here. But uh, if you want to give to the church, you can do so online to the church website. The sermon will be up later today. I had someone ask me last week, um, when do you get that up? It's every week. It depends on what happens in the afternoon, how long my nap is. No, it depends on whether we have family or things like that. It was late last week. But uh, it will be on the church website, Facebook page later today. Share it with someone if you uh, think it's worth sharing. I pray that it is. Also, you can give if you brought an offering, there's a basket here, or you can give online to the church website as well. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. May God bless you. Amen.